Once again, uh, Kevin Komar, I, I know a few of the people in the room, um, just would like to say thank you for all coming out. Uh, we kind of look forward to this. It's, it was a nice little review for me to, uh, to kind of sit down and actually think about this topic for a few minutes, and I, and I kind of hope it helps. Um, I'm starting off the whole topic in the talk about with a couple of questions, because this is the way I learn. I actually took these questions directly from the recent board exam or study exam that I took just a couple of weeks, a couple of months ago, last October. So I went back and I looked up all the questions on functional dyspepsia and thought to myself, what, what is the way they are preface it, the questions? And I thought, you know, this is kind of interesting because I'm going to base my topic around that. Um, so I'm going to let everybody read it. We're going to go over the questions, the different scenarios, then we're going to go over the information, and then we'll go back to the questions. So basically, you get a 54-year-old comes in with dyspepsia. Um, fortunately, a lot of is at this point um, has undergone a fecal antigen test, which demonstrates positive for H. pylori. The question really is, what's the first line antibiotic, and uh, um, what should you use? And more importantly, is that going to be effective in dyspepsia? And how many days do you need? Does the patient need to be treated? And if you don't like these questions, you can understand where I'm coming from, because this was the, literally the exact question that they used. All right, gonna, we're going to do the questions first, just review it, and then go back after we teach ourselves. So try to keep that in the back of your mind. The next question is, it's 25-year-old, presents to the office for evaluation of epigastric abdominal discomfort a couple times a week over the last three years does not have any quote unquote alarm symptoms, has had a negative EGD in the past, no H. pylori is found. Um, you know, you give the diagnosis of functional dyspepsia at that point with epigastric pain syndrome. Which one of these therapies do you recommend as your first line agent? Question number three, 45 year old is referred to your clinic, pain after eating, she describes as fullness, bloating, nausea, um, labs, everything is pretty much unremarkable, no response after a two month trial of a PPI once daily. Next question is what do you do next? I, I really like this question because we see a lot of this where the patient has already been tried on a PPI at a standard dose and they come to the office. All right, so let's just go over some basic facts. Dyspepsia, what we're gonna talk about is the definition, how common is it, what exactly is the etiology, the differential diagnosis, the things you should be thinking about, the supposed pathophysiology, and the current management goals. Um, according to Rome criteria, dyspepsia has this very vague definition. Um, you know, it's, it's the bane of existence to most gastroenterologists. Basically, you only need really one symptom. And I don't know anybody who doesn't present to the GI office or, or my clinic who doesn't at least have one of these symptoms. Pain in the belly, you know, feeling full, um, uh, lack of appetite. It's vague abdominal complaints is basically the definition of dyspepsia. Um, it can be anything. The, the three most common symptoms that we typically see is the postprandial fullness, early satiety, epigastric abdominal pain and discomfort, but you can get symptoms of nausea, vomiting, heartburn, bloating. Uh, we all have seen that patient who comes in who says, I'm just generally bloating. I don't really have any pain or discomfort. Just, just something doesn't feel right. I'm constantly bloated. How common is this? About 25% of the population at some point will report symptoms of dyspepsia. It's slightly more common in women than female. The annual incidence is close to one to 6%. Um, what I think is important about this slide is 75% of patients who have you know, functional idiopathic non ulcer dyspepsia at the end have no underlying cause. 
So this is, I apologize for the small print, um, the basically a differential diagnosis for patients when they walk through the office. When I see them and they've been already been evaluated slightly for abdominal pain and discomfort. And as you can see, I mean, I've, I've put like eight or nine things on this list, but there could possibly be about 20. Typically the first things that I think of when I look at the patient is, and the most common cause is, is peptic ulcer disease, gastroesophageal reflux, chronic abdominal pain. Um, but you, you know, this is where you have to kind of sometimes think outside the box and think of things like, you know, carbohydrate malabsorption, medications, uh, celiac artery compression, parasites, and the things that always scares us, things like abdominal cancer and pancreatic cancer. So the first common things is peptic ulcer disease. Why you should be thinking about peptic ulcer disease uh, in patients with dyspepsia. So as stated on the previous slide, peptic ulcer disease and reflux are a very common etiology of dyspepsia symptoms. It's found in 5 to 15 percent. Um, recently, we've seen obviously a major decline, and this is because of, I think, awareness of patients with uh, NSAID use and also the prevalence of PPIs. I don't, I mean, I don't think we get a patient who comes into the office who's being evaluated by GEI who hasn't louder, I apologize. Um, the reason we have seen a drop in the incidence of peptic ulcer disease typically has to do with the fact that most of the patients by the, at this point, the primary care physician has already started them on a PPI and uh, the awareness of placing patients, especially on long set NSAIDs who are prophylactically being treated on PPIs has tremendously increased. So I don't see most of the peptic ulcer disease that I see, I typically see in the hospital setting. Um, it's very rare that we have a patient come in from the office who says, oh, you know, I've been taking NSAIDs, 800 milligrams, three times a day for the last month and a half, and my primary care physician hasn't started me on a PPI at this point, or that hasn't gone to the back of their mind that they should need to be on some type of prophylaxis. Is that better? I don't, I don't know if I'm speaking loud enough. He went to go check. Okay. Reflux, also found in about 20 patients with um, dyspepsia, typical heartburn, regurgitation, very typical symptoms. You need to be thinking of that. Patients with this, uh, these vague abdominal complaints will also have these, 20% um, uh, of them will have reflux. Um, they've looked at this extensively, and I mean, each one of these topics we could talk about for a half an hour is what exactly is the pathophysiology behind dyspepsia, what causes these symptoms of bloating, early satiety, fullness. Um, there is a long list of suspected or presumed ideologies. Oh, well, hopefully we can fix this. Dr. Merrill, can you hear me? He's, he's having dyspepsia right now. I know, I know. <laughs> so, uh, John Denver, that's what we decided on? All right, let's see. All right, so the question to us, this is every gastroenterologist has to ask, who needs endoscopy? Who comes to our office that right away we need to think about needs to be endoscopically evaluated? This is also important for primary care because this is the patient who you need to tell yourself you need to refer, obviously, out. Um, anybody over the age, according to the new guidelines, over the age of 55 with uh, dyspepsia symptoms who has not been evaluated, right away, that person, if they have not been checked and they're complaining of abdominal discomfort or pain, I think to myself, obviously, we need to take a look. Um, the rest, to me, are, you know, no-brainers. you got weight loss, you got evidence of bleeding, you have anemia, dysphagia, persistent vomiting. If you feel a mass, they need an endoscopy. Um, if there's a family history of GI malignancy, I, forget, I surprisingly see lots of patients who come in will say, you know, I've had three or four uncles who've had stomach cancer, do I need to be checked? I always tell them, yes, yes, you need to be checked. Um, what we're expecting or under the impression is that their H. pylori status has been checked prior. Um, that's what typical I would recommend as a first workup. If you've got a patient that comes into your office and is having um, symptoms dyspepsia, the first guideline is you, you want to check their H. pylori status. 
Okay, so this is a meta-analysis. The question was basically looking at on patients who are determined to have dyspepsia, when you check their H. pylori status and you, if they are found to be positive um, and you treat it, um, what it does it actually improve the patient's symptoms? Because there's lots of patients walking around who have H. pylori who don't have dyspepsia and there's lots of patients walking around who you diagnose with dyspepsia and H. pylori and you treat and they don't get better. So a recent meta-analysis, I think this was done just last year, um, basically said yes. If you find a patient who's positive for mo multiple other reasons, statistically speaking, if you treat their H. pylori, there will be a small magnitude of improvement in the general population. All right. This is a, a, an outline of H. pylori eradication. This was, uh, I believe, from last year's guidelines. Um, why I think this is very important is, is they love to ask this question on all GI boards recently. I think I saw it like six or seven times was the treatment regimen, what you should be asking. And let me see, does this have a pointer? Obviously, penicillin and allergy directs the way you're going to treat, but the other question is, has the patient had a previous macrolide exposure? That's where you need to ask the patient, have they been treated before with their macrolide? And that totally directs the treatment regimen. There's been multiple studies that have said that if a patient has had previous macrolides within two years and you diagnose them with H. pylori, treating them with a macrolide will not be as effective. So the first question you ask once you've diagnosed a patient who has been diagnosed with H. pylori is one, are they pen, penicillin allergic? And two, have they had any macrolide exposure in the last two years? Uh, this is the next very important question. We see this a lot. A lot of patients will come in. Yes? So do you mean if the patient even had a DPAP? Yes. You're supposed to avoid the macrolide. <clears throat> yeah. And for the gastroenterologist in the room, that was the exact question that was on the boards just a month and a half ago. Patient, previous ZPAC came in, what do you need to do? What, which antibiotic regimen should you use? The next question is, the next important thing is actual duration. We get a lot of patients who get diagnosed with H. pylori and the first thing I ask them is, how long were you treated for? Um, it's shocking because the guidelines, you know, there's, there's a lot of variation out there. Some people say I got five days of treatment, seven days of treatment, 14 days of treatment. I've seen people say that they were treated for 28 days even. Um, a recent meta-analysis basically looked on what is the ideal treatment um, where how many is the minimum amount of days you need to, to have um, a significant eradication and it was at least 14 days. So any board question that says treat for seven or ten days, that's immediately wrong right off the bat. Fourteen days treatment, you need to ask whether they're penicillin allergic or if they've had any macrolide exposure. So going back to after talking about H. pylori, the diagnosis of functional dyspepsia. We've talked about the symptoms. You know, obviously when the patient, we evaluate the patient, we look at the history, the physical exam. To really make the diagnosis, you need an endoscopic evaluation to exclude any organic or structural abnormalities. Yes? So uh, before you lose H. pylori completely, yep. uh, so you've done your breath test and positive, you've treated them, still have symptoms, are you going to do some follow-up studies to make sure that they are, have been eradicated from the stool test at that point? Yes. Uh, well, you could do the stool test if you wanted. I mean, if they're still having symptoms after you've treated their H. pylori, I would at that point obviously refer them out to make sure that we're not missing anything else. Because in order to make the diagnosis, you do have to exclude any, like I said, organic or structural. If I have Typically, in my patients who we find and diagnose with H. pylori, we treat them obviously for a 14-day regimen. I bring everybody back after six months and just bring them back, see how they're doing, and check. But the appropriate test to do at that point is stool test. Yeah, stool test, you know, there's a, 
a huge controversy over what's, everybody says what's the perfect stool test, uh, what's the perfect test, because there's a big push right now, at least in the GI societies with cost, but I check, I do a stool test. Yeah, you're, you can't go wrong with a stool test. Has to wait six months to um, you don't have to wait six months. I believe you can check it four weeks after the eradication. Two to four weeks is what the guidelines say, but I like to wait at least six months, right? This is the next, next treatment options. Does placing the patient on a PPI who has dyspepsia, does that actually make their symptoms better? So here's the algorithm that you're thinking in your mind. One, the patient comes in, has the abdominal discomfort. You've diagnosed them with what you believe is functional dyspepsia, very mild symptoms. The first thing you're doing is you're checking their H. pylori status. You find that it's negative. You tell yourself, okay, it's negative. What's the, what, what do I try now? Most patients, even at the, that appointment, will say, you know what, let's do a small trial of PPIs to see if that makes you feel better. And the thought process behind that is obviously, as we described, 20% of the patients have similar or corresponding reflux symptoms, which maybe relate to it. So this was a recent uh, uh, Cochrane review, just I want to say less than six, seven years ago, that basically looked at the benefits of PPI in patients with dyspepsia. And just to summarize it, um, there, there is a very small improvement, but a recorded improvement of patients with dyspepsia symptoms and resolution of symptoms on a PPI. Um, there is no significant number of adverse effects and no better on higher doses. So going back to thinking back to that original question, if that patient comes in and you put them on once a day PPI, that's perfectly safe. A trial of once a day PPI to see if that resolves the symptoms is perfectly safe. Increasing the PPI to twice a day is not going to do a thing. All right? How long? Well, if, how long? Typically, I like to reassess the patient. I put them on a PPI. Most of them will say six to eight weeks is what the guideline says. And then reassess. I don't bring patients back in six to eight weeks. I like to typically bring them back in four to six months and say try the medications after six months if you want to decrease it or stop it, you can. And if you're still having the symptoms come back in, but typically I bring the patient back in six months. All right? The key here is one, no major risk and side effects. Two, it has been statistically been shown to benefit or resolve the symptoms. And three, no benefit on higher doses of PPI. So I see a lot of the times the patient has been seen by the primary care physician they have dyspepsia, H. pylori negative, somebody places them on a PPI, it doesn't get better. They put them on a twice a day PPI, it doesn't get better. I've even seen three times a day PPI and then they finally come to us. So that, that whole process is necessary. If they're going to get better, it's going to be on the once a day and that's it. Okay, so the next thing is we've gone down the algorithm where we thought to ourselves H. pylori status, PPI, the PPI doesn't work, what's the next line of drugs? What we think about. The, 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 the biggest line of drugs that have been checked and investigated in this case is antidepressants. People have looked at the, obviously the two big classes, tricyclics and serotonin. This is a, a general meta-analysis that they did a couple of years ago, I want to say two to three years ago, basically looking at the role of antidepressants in the treatment of functional dyspepsia. Now understand that. This is, I don't start a patient on an antidepressant unless we've done the workup. So we've done the checking for H. pylori. We've done the trial of PPI. We've done the ruled out any significant organic or causes. We've done the differential. Then we thought to ourselves, you know what? I can't find a cause. They're not better. They don't have an infection. This is the patient that I say, let's, let's see about a trial of antidepressants. This is a recent amount of analysis. As you can see, the risk ratios all over it greater than 1 with 95% confidence interval.
basically the conclusion, this is very important, is that tricyclates uh, but not SSRIs are effective in the treatment of functional dyspepsia. Um, but uh, antidepressants were also associated with more adverse effects versus placebo. We know that. I mean, we start these patients on uh, tricyclic antidepressants and they are lots of side effects. So that's something you need to be uh, aware of. If you're going to pick a class of antidepressants, you want it to be a tricyclic versus an SSRI. Yes? It seems to be very much counterintuitive that a tricyclic would be an effective agent other than to treat the pain. Yeah. Because you're going to induce dry mouth concentration. Yeah, I agree. I agree. But I mean, con you know, they've looked at that a lot. And uh, this goes back to that. I wish I could take it back five or ten slides. What exactly is the pathophysiology behind dyspepsia? And there's, there's a lot of suggest suggested concepts and ideas. You know, if you have got a patient who's got, you know, lower GI symptoms, I don't really diagnose that patient with dyspepsia. I, I more think of I've got the diarrhea, the constipation, and that IBS category rather than dyspepsia. So yeah, you would think that. I mean, it, it in you know, in the back of your mind, you would say, why would a tricyclic work? I mean, especially with all the GI side effects that individuals get. But my success has been that patients do better on tricyclics too. All right, this is the algorithm. Now I blended the recent algorithm and the recent ACG algorithm to make it more understandable. Um, Patient comes in with symptoms of dyspepsia. The first thing I think to myself, and this is this what you should be thinking to yourself as a, you know, as a pr primary provider, is one, the alarm symptoms that we talked about. I mean, I don't need to define those. Everybody knows what those are: the, the fevers, the night sweats, the weight loss. Um, is the patient above the age of 55? Um, um, is there is there any significant family history? If they have these alarm symptoms or they're having 55 you want to refer that patient for additional workup to a gastroenterologist. You want, you want us to make sure that we go through the differential and that we're not excluding anything outside the common realm that we talked about, like, dis, like GERD or peptic ulcer disease. Typically in patients who have no alarm symptoms under the age of 55, the first thing we do is you want to confirm their H. pylori status. We talked about that. You want to be asking them whether they're penicillin allergic, whether they're, they've got any macrolide exposure. If they are positive, the next step is say, you know what, let's treat. Let's see how the symptoms do. Let's give it three to six months to bring you back to see how you're feeling. Um, my experience has been when patients are referred to us before their H. pylori status, I would say at least half my patients six months back come back and say, I feel perfectly fine. You treated the infection, I feel perfectly fine. And we know that I wouldn't say 50% is probably accurate according to the meta-analysis, but there is a significant, there is an improvement in patients with dyspepsia symptoms who are treated, who are diagnosed and treated with H. pylori. If they're negative for H. pylori or they have been um, treated for H. pylori and they're still having symptoms, the next is a trial of PPI. At that point, if there has been no improvement on a PPI, I would recommend that you refer the patient to a gastroenterologist. At that point, we have to th kind of think outside the box. The two most common things, um, obviously, that are associated with dyspepsia have been uh, treated for and excluded. At that point, what I typically do is I try a, a trial of an uh, additional trial of PPI or look at the PPI, make sure that they're, you know, uh, review their medications, do the endoscopy to exclude any organic causes. Typically, at that point, I'll try a uh, tricyclic antidepressant. So going back to the questions, hopefully we re all the things we reviewed make the four questions understandable. 54-year-old with dyspepsia undergoes fecal antigen test, which demonstrates H. pylori infection. Which one is your first line of antibiotic therapy for H. pylori? <coughs> So, key here, at least 14 days, right? That's just a horribly tested question, a horribly asked question, but it was the question they used on the board, so, yeah. Um, anything below 14 days, you want to ask yourself, that's not the right treatment regimen. You should not be treating patients for less than 14 days. 
25 year old presents to your office for evaluation of epigastric abdominal pain multiple times in the last three years. Workup has so far been negative. Everything looks fine. Question is, which one of the following therapies would you recommend first line? There you go. PPI, right? Patients come to me all the time saying, what's, you know, I've got all these vague symptoms. What's the magic diet? There is no magic diet. I haven't found one yet. I don't know about you guys, but there is no magic diet. Is there any current prokinetic therapy other than Um, You know, there a lot of patients, we have a lot of patients that I'll treat with a short dose of erythromycin, but no, I think Reglan right now is kind of the standard of care. At least it's FDA approved. Unless there's, do you guys know anything else new coming out? I mean, I know there's been talk about stuff in the pipelines there's for prokinetic. Like there three stages. Yeah, yeah. Right yeah. 45 year old referred to your clinic for postprandial pain. Labs are everything is unremarkable. No response and a trial of PPIs for two months. Once daily, the key here being once daily. What's your next best management? This is more of a GI question, but this is where we go and where I look at this patient. I've excluded everything else. We feel comfortable that this is just all functional idiopathic dyspepsia. I typically like amtriptyline. Yeah. That's it. I know that was quick and brief. I can do John Denver if anybody wants. Okay. Okay. Any, any other questions for the